California's brave new world of AI legislation. I'm Randy Bandman, chair of the Entertainment Law Section of the Beverly Hills Bar Association. Our Entertainment Law Section is sponsored by Lawyers Mutual Insurance Company. I wanted to point out that if any of our attendees have any questions, they can post them in the Q&A box in the Zoom, and our panelists will do their best to get to them as the program um, proceeds. Today's program will be led by Douglas Morrell, Beverly Grossman Palmer, and Peter Jackson. Douglas Morrell is a partner at Greenberg Lusker LLP. Douglas represents celebrities, entertainers, companies, guilds, media concerns, and others in litigation over the course of several decades and counting. His imprint can be found on hundreds of important entertainment related issues that were resolved in the courts or that required legislative action. Beverly Grossman Palmer is a partner at Strumwasser and Wucher. Beverly joined her firm after serving as a law clerk for the Honorable Dorothy W. Nelson of the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. Ms. Grossman Palmer represents clients in the fields of election law, land use, and environmental law, economic regulation, and education law. She has appeared in both state court and administrative proceedings and before local governments. She also advises clients on compliance with campaign finance and reporting laws, as well as provides guidance and analysis on the initiative process. Last, we have Peter Jackson. Peter is counsel at Greenberg Glusker LLP. Peter helps businesses with broad aspects of technology-related operations to focus on complex contracts involving IP, data, security, and privacy issues. He advises on emerging issues like rights and output from generative AI tools, on-chain contracts, and data strategy, as well as nimble compliance under state and federal privacy laws like CCPA and HIPAA. His clients include content companies, AI developers, and Web3 organizations, as well as SaaS providers and consumer products brands for both B2C and B2B purposes. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Brandy. Thank uh, you. So uh, we will start screen sharing now. And if we can page ahead to the agenda, you'll see where we're uh, going to head. Uh, I've got the first uh, four uh, measures, uh, and uh, Beverly will be dealing with uh, the next four, including one that uh, is uh, currently inoperative because of uh, an injunction that was issued. And uh, uh, Peter will be batting cleanup uh, and dealing with uh, another uh, four uh, bills and, uh, and one. And we are all, I think, going to chime in a little bit to talk about uh, SB 1047, which was vetoed uh, by Governor Newsom, uh, but was a significant AI piece of legislation. So let's move on. Uh, the first two bills I'm going to address focus mostly on the ways in which artificial intelligence impacts the entertainment industry, uh, AB 1836 and 2602. Turning first to AB 1836, California has had a postmortem right of publicity since 1985 and is currently one of 27 states, uh, recently including New York, to recognize such a right. Uh, in 1999, the legislature amended our Civil Code Section 3344.1 to add broad exemptions for essentially all expressive works, including plays, books, music, magazines, newspapers, radio, TV, audiovisual works, and advertisements for all such works, so long as they were, quote, fictional or non-fictional, entertainment, or a dramatic literary or musical work, close quote. Now, in light of these exemptions and in this brave new era of artificial intelligence, it was obvious that deceased performers would be unable to prevent the post-mortem digital exploitation of their voices and likenesses in movies, TV, video games, and sound recordings by means of the post-mortem right of publicity statute. Consequently, with the Screen Actors Guild, American Federation of Television and Radio Artists, otherwise known as SAG-AFTRA, as its sponsor, the legislature passed and Governor Newsom signed AB 1836. Uh, I should add that in the interest of full disclosure, uh, 
Uh, I served as a technical legal expert who testified in Sacramento on behalf of SAG-AFTRA in support of this legislation before three separate legislative committees. Now, AB 1836 precludes the production or distribution of a digital replica, quote unquote, of a deceased personality's voice or likeness in expressive works without the prior consent of the decedent's heirs or other representatives. Uh, for purposes of this legislation, as well as 2602, the next bill I'm going to address, digital replicas are defined as, quote, a computer-generated, highly realistic electronic representation that is readily identifiable as the voice or visual likeness of an individual in a work in which the actual individual did not actually perform or appear, or the actual individual did perform or appear, but the fundamental character of the performance or appearance has been materially altered, close quote. That's the definition of a digital replica. Confronted initially with opposition from the studios and the Motion Picture Association, AB 1836 was eventually amended to include a significant number of exemptions for uses such as news, sports broadcasts, commentary, criticism, scholarship, satire, and parody. Also exempt from liability is what has been colloquially characterized as the Forrest Gump exemption, namely the representation of an individual in a somewhat fictionalized historical work, quote, unless the use is intended to create and does create the false impression that the work is an authentic recording in which the individual participated. So think Tom Hanks' character's encounters with Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, and Nixon in Forrest Gump. Uh, a civil action can be brought for violation of this digital replica right with available statutory damages of $10,000 or the actual damages suffered by the person controlling the deceased personality's voice or likeness rights. Uh, this law becomes effective on January 1st of 2025. So now let's next look at AB 2602. As many of you will doubtless recall, the topic of artificial intelligence was a significant aspect of the strike that lasted from July to November of 2023 by SAG-AFTRA against the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, the AMPTP. As part of the deal that ended that strike, two categories of digital replicas were created employment-based and independently created. For employment-based digital replicas, producers must provide advance notice and obtain the performer's clear and conspicuous consent in a signed writing separate from the employment contract. And this applies to both sequels and prequels. And for independently created digital replicas, producers must likewise negotiate with performers or their authorized representatives. But what happens if performers or employers are not SAG-AFTRA members or signatories? And that's where AB 2602 kicks in. Uh, as I indicated before, uh, the two use the term digital replica in precisely the same way, but AB 2602 creates a new labor code section that renders unenforceable any provision in an agreement for the performance of new personal or professional services by such a digital replica unless three conditions are met. First, specific permission must be given to create a digital replica of the individual's voice or likeness. Second, with certain exceptions, there must be a reasonably specific description of the intended use. And third, the individual must have been represented by legal counsel who negotiated the provision and whose commercial terms are stated clearly and conspicuously in a writing signed by the individual, or that individual must have been represented by a labor union that represents workers who do the proposed work under terms of a collective bargaining agreement that expressly addresses use of digital replicas, such as the 2023 SAG-AFTRA Memorandum of Agreement that ended the AMPTP strike. Now, the apparent remedy for a violation of this labor code section would involve a declaration voiding the non-conforming provisions of any such agreement, and AB 2602 is effective for newly created performances that are fixed on or after January 1st. Uh, 
So moving beyond bills whose impact will be felt most acutely by the entertainment community, AB 2013 requires us to explore the world of generative artificial intelligence, which it defines as artificial intelligence that can generate derived synthetic con content, such as text, images, videos, and audio that emulate the structure and characteristics of an AI training set. AB 2013 obligates a developer of Gen AI, as I'll call it, systems or services to post on that developer's internet website extensive documentation by means of a high-level summary identifying the data sets used for Gen AI training. And this information must include, among other things, the sources or owners of the data sets, a description of how those data sets further the intended purpose of the Gen AI, whether the data sets include any data protected by copyright, trademark, or patent, or are entirely within the public domain, whether the data sets contain any personal information and eight additional categories of information. These website posting obligations apply to newly created or substantially modified Gen AI that is released on or after January 1, 2022, but that posting need not take place under this legislation until January 1 of 2026 at the very latest. And for any Gen AI that is newly created or modified after that date, the required postings must precede their release. And these obligations, I should add, apply only to Gen AI that is made publicly available for use by Californians, which, of course, if it's on the internet, it's going to be available. The developers who use data to, tra to train Gen AI are exempt from these disclosure requirements if any of three conditions exist. One, the sole purpose of the Gen AI is to help ensure security and integrity involving data breach and similar incidents. Two, the sole purpose of the Gen AI is the operation of aircraft in national airspace. Or three, the Gen AI was developed for national security, military, or defense purposes and is made available exclusively to a federal entity. Uh, though the bill doesn't contain any specifically identified penalties, Developers who disclose that they've used unauthorized training data would presumably be exposed to liability for the misuse of that data under pre-existing laws, such as, for example, California's Consumer Records Law. So the final bill I'm going to discuss is SB 942. Effective January 1, 2026, the legis this legislation obligates a quote-unquote covered provider to make available at no cost an AI detection tool that meets specified criteria, including public accessibility. Now, content providers are defined to mean someone who creates codes or otherwise produces a Gen AI system that has over 1 million monthly visitors or users and is publicly accessible to anyone within California. The detection tool that such covered providers must make freely available has to meet six specified criteria, the most significant of which are that it must allow a user to assess whether the image, video, and or audio content was created or altered by that covered provider's own Gen AI system, and it must identify the provenance of any other data detected in that content. Beyond this information, SB 942 obligates covered providers to also offer their users the option to include a manifest disclosure, quote unquote, of Gen AI content that is clear, conspicuous, appropriate for the medium, and uh, understandable to a reasonable person. Covered providers are further required to include a latent disclosure of Gen AI related information. It includes the name of the content provider, the name and version of the Gen AI system that created or altered the content, as well as its time and date of creation or alteration. Uh, SB 942 contains an exception for, quote, any product, service, internet website, or application that provides exclusively non-user generated video game, television, streaming, movie, or interactive experiences. Violations of these Gen AI detection and tool detection tool disclosure requirements 
expose a covered provider to a civil penalty of $5,000 per violation in a civil action that can be brought only by the attorney general, a county council, or a city attorney. Significantly, and in order to encourage prompt compliance, every day of non-disclosure is deemed to be a separate, discrete violation. So in an action against a covered provider, a prevailing plaintiff, but not a prevailing defendant, is entitled to recover its reasonable attorney's fees and costs. Finally, civil actions may also be brought by the same governmental plaintiffs against third-party licensees that have either modified a licensed Gen AI system in a manner that makes it incapable of providing these required disclosures, or if that licensee fails to cease using a licensed Gen AI system after that system's license has been revoked. The penalties for such violations by third-party licensees are injunctive relief and reasonable attorney's fees and costs. With that, I turn the program over to Beverly Palmer. Hi, thank you. And it's nice to speak to the entertainment lawyers. I don't get to meet you all very often as an elections attorney. Um, I will be speaking about three bills, AB 2355, AB 2655, and AB 2839, all of which went through the legislative process together and were heard by the same committees at roughly the same times. Uh, all of these bills attempt to address the legislature's concerns about the use of artificial intelligence to generate extremely realistic looking materials that are deceptive in the context of election materials. Uh, the concern was that generative as the legislature's, um, one of the legislative analysis, analyses of these bills pointed out, generative AI can provide what seems like dispositive evidence of truth or falsity. And so the legislature attempted to address that concern in these three bills by both requiring disclosures on communications and in some instances outright prohibiting certain speech and requiring content providers to remove certain speech. So to turn to, uh, and this is not, it, some of it is new, but it builds on existing state law. So even since the founding of California in the first legislative session, the state enacted a penalty for deceiving a voter and causing the voter to elect, to choose a different candidate than the voter had intended. But at the same time, the um, the Constitution and the California Constitution both contain speech rights and protect large categories of speech, especially political speech. And so what the legislature is doing in these three bills is balancing these speech rights against the governmental interests in ensuring election integrity and in information disclosure to the public. And there is a bit of a tightrope, as you will see. Um, so... AI certainly heightened the legislature's concern about misinformation in elections, though there were already existing laws addressing that topic. Um, but some of the concerns that the legislature was but was reporting in, in its analyses were things like in Slovakia, there was a fake audio recording of a candidate that spread online in the days before an election and put him in a very bad light and he lost the election. Uh, in the U.S., voters in New Hampshire, thousands of voters got calls from an AI-generated Joe Biden telling them not to vote in the primary election and save their vote for November. There were fake images used in ads for DeSantis. There were fake images used in RNC ads. There was a fake image of a manipulated Anderson Cooper image in a Trump campaign ad. And so all of these, uh, all of these alarm the legislature, though it got particularly alarmed when Governor Newsom reacted to a particular parody video that I'll discuss as we move through this content. But pre before all of these bills were passed, pre-AI, back in 2019, the legislature enacted Elections Code 20010, uh, which prohibited within 60 days of an election materially deceptive audio or visual manipulations of candidate images uh, that were con conveyed with distributed with actual malice. So I think if you manipulate an image of a candidate um, to make that candidate appear to do something they didn't do, malice is probably not that difficult to show. Uh, but the material could be distributed as long as it had the disclaimer that this video or photo or audio has been manipulated. 
Um, and notably, this did not apply to satire or parody. So satirical and par parody content could be continued to just be distributed without any disclaimer or any restrictions. So turning first to AB 2034, 2355, uh, which I think is the most straightforward of the bills. This was an amendment to the Political Reform Act. The Political Reform Act governs electoral campaigns and highly regulates political committees that are engaged in those campaigns. So you've probably received uh, election mail or seen TV ads during an election and noticed that there is a disclaimer on that mail or at the end of those ads. And those disclaimers tell you who paid for the ad, who are maybe who are the top funders of the ad. And all of those disclaimers are a form of compelled speech. But the Supreme Court of the US has upheld those kind of disclaimers as you know, sufficiently narrowly tailored to serve an important governmental interest in, in telling people you know, where the source of money in politics is. And they there is um, little, there is little chance, I think, in the future of disclaimers being held to violate the First Amendment. So the, um, this 20, AB 2035 adds a disclaimer requirement to our already numerous disclaimers, uh, ad generated or substantially altered using AI. Now, in the course of considering this bill, the legislature had to confront what they meant by AI. The originally version of this bill was so broad that just even using Photoshop to edit an image would likely have required the disclaimer. So they wound up narrowing the definition down to AI is an engineered or machine-based system that varies in its level of autonomy and that can, from explicit or implicit objectives, infer from the input it receives how to generate outputs that can influence physical or virtual environments. Uh, now, this law applies to both candidates and ballot measures, which is a little broader than our previous restrictions, and there's no malice or defamatory intent required. There's no time limit. It applies to any time in any, to any election material that is generated using AI. Um, I think that that presents a challenge for compliance because I don't, as an elections attorney, I don't know how an ad is created and it will require me to understand how an ad might have been uh, created, what tools were used, do those tools constitute AI? Um, I think it creates some ambiguities and challenges that way. It can be enforced, it will be enforced by the Fair Political Practices Commission, which enforces other parts of the Political Reform Act who uh, can seek injunctive relief uh, or penalties. Typically they seek penalties. The maximum is 5,000 per violation, which is like 5,000 per missing disclaimer. Uh, that is a maximum that is not typically imposed. Uh, but this will be interesting to see how, how that plays out in future elections where attorneys and other advisors of candidates and campaigns are required to discern how an ad was created. I'll turn now to AB 2839, um, which is, it has a strike through on it because it was overturned by, well, not overturned, but it's preliminarily enjoined. And this is a definitely a broader bill. It goes from regulating advertisements paid for by political committees who are already subject to significant regulation um, to regulating content by anybody and specific types of content. Um, and it builds on Elections Code 20010 from 2019, which um, applied to ads in the 60 days before an election with intent to deceive and actual malice. Now this regulates a much broader category of communications within a longer period, 120 days of the election. Uh, the legislature tried to use the standard that the Supreme Court set forth quite some years ago in New York Times versus Sullivan about speech that is a protect so protecting speech that is maybe false speech but that is not made with actual malice but the way they did so may have caused it may have been a little broader than what New York Times versus Sullivan would apply to so normally actual malice would be demonstrated if somebody knowingly or without a reasonable investigation made false or made false factual false statements. Um, now here, this statute prohibits speech that portrays a candidate as doing or saying something they did not do or say, and the content is reasonably likely to harm the reputation or electoral prospects of the candidate. Now, this also expressly included candidates for president or vice president, 
which given the internet would basically make California set a nationwide standard for um, content of speech about presidential candidates. Uh, and I don't think the legislature really discussed or considered that implication of that law. Um, and it also prohibits, really interestingly, um, speech about elections officials or elected officials portrayed doing something they did or did not do or say if the content is reasonably likely to falsely undermine confidence in the outcome of one or more election contests. And it prohibits manipulated speech showing voting machines, ballots, voting sites, or property or equipment related to elections in a materially false way if the content is likely to undermine falsely undermine confidence in the outcome of an election contest. Uh, so as originally proposed, the legislation exempted satire entirely, uh, satire and parody. Uh, but as it was ultimately enacted, it required a disclaimer on satire and parody. So it, it did not, it, it now regulates it and requires a disclaimer that states, you know, this video has been manipulated for purposes of satire or parody. And not only does it require a disclaimer, it requires a Disclaimer that is the size of the largest font used in the media, and as uh, as we will see, sometimes this font can that can actually make it impossible to even employ the disclaimer effectively on the ad. Um, it is broad in that it allows any person who receives the communication to sue for injunctive relief and recover damages and attorney's fees, and it had an urgency clause, so it would immediately apply. So AB 2355, the one we just talked about, said, you just tell us if you manipulated an ad. But here, now the legislature is saying you can't even engage in certain categories of speech at all. And if you do engage in that speech for the purposes of satire, you need to include a disclaimer. There's also, I didn't discuss this too much uh, in the slide, but there's also an exemption for candidates. They can portray themselves doing something they didn't do if they want, which sometimes they may wish to do, but they have to use a disclaimer as well. Um, so you can't kind of pump yourself up as a candidate falsely uh, without a disclaimer. Um, so this law was uh, immediately put to the test and the legislature seems to have anticipated some First Amendment issues if you read the analyses of the bill. Um, is put to the test in Coles versus Bonta, which is on our next slide, a little summary of the holding. So Coles is an internet content creator who is known as Mr. Reagan. Uh, Coles created a number of parody ads of, well, he creates lots of parodies, but in particular of Kamala Harris. And there was one that he, the first one he did uh, shortly after she became the candidate for president where he used a pretty accurate sounding voice of Kamala Harris and clipped it with a bunch of images of her and made a thing labeled Kamala Harris ad parody. So it was called a parody uh, where he had her say things like, I am the ultimate diversity hire and I was trained by the ultimate deep state puppet, Joe Biden. I watched the ad. I found it to be obviously a parody, um, but Newsom saw this ad and was quite offended and posted on Twitter that such an ad should be illegal and it would soon be made illegal in California. Um that is when AB 2839 went from exempting satire and parody to requiring the big disclaimer, which in the case of these videos, because the font sizes used were so large that it would have basically covered the entire screen of the video. Um, so Coles filed his suit uh, basically the day the governor signed the bill into law and it was enjoined shortly thereafter by October 2nd. Uh, the court found two major issues with the bill. And I think one of them is a lot harder to deal with than the other. So just to talk about the easy one first, uh, that disclaimer, the giant disclaimer, he said that A, that was too burdensome to, to, to use such a giant disclaimer. And it obviously was going, it was compelling a speech that was impossible to engage in. And, but, at the same time, he found that a disclaimer requirement might be a reasonable one if it was narrowly tailored enough. But really the biggest problem that the court had with this, which I think is going to make it a little challenging for the legislature if this is upheld, is that 
it used it addressed such a broad amount of speech because it required it prohibited speech affecting things that were really in, in, kind of ineluctable like it's something that suppressed a candidate's elect affected the electoral prospects of a candidate. I mean, how do we know what kind of speech is or isn't going to do that? Or that undermined confidence in election results. And his example, the judge's example on that was AI, an image showing AI generated numbers of voter turnout could undermine confidence in an election. And you know, that could be true. So the court found that that really suppressed such a broad amount of speech. It really wasn't just speech that classically would have caused harm um, in, in previous cases. This was kind of going and plowing a new field of potential harm that courts had not yet um, found to be speech that could be suppressed. Um, and I mean, the court also said, you know, you, you know, this is a strict scrutiny applies to the speech because this is content based regulation. And so you must use the least restrictive means to further your interest. And the court did agree that the government has a compelling interest in ensuring election integrity and thought that a disclaimer could be appropriate, but it needed to be more narrowly tailored. And it was difficult to tell whether the court would have upheld, say, a requirement that all of the material had a disclaimer, you know, something that didn't prohibit the speech entirely, but that required a disclaimer on any manipulated material like AB 2355 does. Uh, but I will note that there is another lawsuit that has been stayed, but pending how Coles v. Bonta is resolved. It's by Babylon B, which is seemingly a, some sort of satirical publication, they have argued that even requiring a disclaimer on satire or parody is unconstitutional because it kills the joke. Maybe that is something that entertainment lawyers will appreciate. As an election lawyer, we're so used to disclaimers, it's hard to imagine objecting. Uh, but so stay tuned on Coles versus Bonta. That's just a preliminary injunction, but it does point to some potential problems regulating this material in the political sphere. And so finally, AB 2655, which is the most different of the laws, uh, the kind of newest thing, it imposes new obligations on large online platforms to actually take down content. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this will face a First Amendment challenge as well, though it has not yet because it's not in effect immediately, but it will go in effect soon. So it applies in the 120-day pre-election period and 60-day post-election to large online platforms, which have at least 1 million California users. Um, and it applies to material about certain candidates, including presidential candidates and candidates for statewide office, state legislature, and House of Representatives. But it does not apply at all to satire or parody, even if it's materially deceptive. So the legislature did carve out satire and parody here. But it requires the online providers, the online platforms to actually remove material that contains materially deceptive content, which is audio or visual media that is digitally created or modified, and that includes but is not limited to deep fakes and the output of chatbots, such that it would falsely appear to a reasonable person to be an authentic record of the content depicted in the media. Deep fake is audio, visual, audio or visual media that is digitally created and modified such that it would falsely appear to a reasonable person to be an authentic record of the actual speech or conduct of the individual depicted in the media. Um, so there were definitely some concerns raised about a lot of this legislation, um, I mean, it's required to remove the materially deceptive content only if it's reasonably likely to harm the reputation or electoral prospects of a candidate or falsely undermine confidence in the outcome of election. Otherwise, it just has to be labeled that the content has been manipulated and is not authentic. Um, and it creates a reporting regime for residents to report content that should be removed or labeled. Now, the it was pointed out that especially it used to have a broader definition of candidates, but even with this, it's very difficult for these companies to know um, what needs to be removed. The, they would need to determine not only that the person portrayed is a candidate, when that election is going to be, what if the candidate actually did the thing that is portrayed. In some cases, that's easy to figure out, but sometimes with a less obvious like state assembly or state legislature races, we might not know as much about these candidates. It's harder to figure it out. And there are also lots of 
special local elections to replace like smaller elections when candidates need to be replaced. So it would apply in those contexts as well. It just creates a real challenge for those companies to detect that material. And opponents, it should include the ACLU and industry groups, found that the measure was not narrowly tailored enough. And even though as Doug indicated, talking about SB 942, I think it was, that there may be tools to allow detection of digital modification. It There is not technology to detect whether something is materially deceptive um, so that it appears authentic, but has a force, false portrayal relating to, you know, that will give a reasonable likelihood of harming the reputation or electoral prospects or undermining confidence in the election. And so the ACLU and the industry groups were concerned that platforms would err on the side of blocking content and burdening speech. Uh, as an elections attorney, I'm also concerned. Uh, I see that political compliance is a tool used by adversaries frequently to report on potential issues that their opponent may have to generate a story saying, oh, there's an investigation of this person. Um, because you know they made like one mistake on a whatever. So it's there is a lot of potential for abuse here where um, I could see potentially reports being submitted if the media platforms are erring on the side of taking down things, it could really massively magnify these problems and you know, if there's no requirement that the candidates, the other side of the issue be notified and given the opportunity to defend the materials. So I understand what the objectives are here, but it is challenging. And I think the reliance on the same con same idea of, you know, reasonably likely to harm the reputation or electoral prospects or falsely undermine confidence is going to make this bill challenging to defend when it is invariably subjected to strict scrutiny. Um, so that is, that uh, the agenda had me covering the next bill, but actually Peter's gonna hit it. Yep. So I'll toss the ball over to him. Thank Thanks you, so yeah. Um, we'll come to some more uh, difficult, difficult implementation uh, rules in some of these other laws as well. Um, unlike Beverly and Doug, I'm not a subject matter expert in the criminal laws that will come up later, but we'll talk about what they what they do uh, in a pretty general sense. Um, 2885, which you see here, is kind of an everything else bill. Uh, it does a bunch of different things that are not necessarily interrelated, but for the most part have to do with public sector implementation and use of generative AI, um, or AI more broadly. Um, I'll just say that first, it it makes a very slight modification to existing law that applies to social media platforms. Um, it, basically, social media platforms already, if they are of a certain size, um, have to disclose in a semi-annual report to the California Attorney General certain information about how they operate, um, including content moderation policies. And those disclosures are now required to encompass more particularly um, decisions about content or the use of uh, artificial intelligence in making those decisions um, with respect to anything that users are posting or doing on their platform. Um, so that's a slightly smaller change. The rest of them are related pretty much to government activity. Um, most substantially, there is a section of the bill that essentially imports the pending California Privacy Protection Agency regulations around what it calls automated decision-making technology into and against public institutions, and they're obligated to report that information uh, the same way that a private business would kind of to the uh, the legislature and other uh, bodies within the California government. In addition, the public sector institutions have to follow some uh, compliance guidance. Um, this builds upon a pre-existing executive order from Governor Newsom from 2023 that already had the California Department of Technology promulgating some guidelines. Those are going to have the force of law uh, to a greater extent than they did previously. Um, and also in the education space, there are a couple of changes that require uh, California community colleges to, to follow that and also to, to a lesser extent the UCs um, in terms of procurement of AI technology, and to a lesser extent with the educational institutions, some, some reporting around usage. Um, 
Finally, there is, why am I blanking on number four? Ugh. I don't know. What is number four? Ah, yes. The, <laughs> again, it's the everything bill. So these are kind of unrelated. Uh, economic subsidies for certain types of uh, public, uh, I guess, economic subsidies for private sector businesses in certain spaces uh, now have to take into account in assessing the appropriateness of the subsidy, the extent to which the business that is receiving the subsidy would be using artificial intelligence to automate work or displace workers. Um, it's pretty narrowly tailored um, to what I think is best described for purposes of today's presentation as warehouses. Um, it's kind of long and short of 2885. I'm not sure how many government practitioners uh, we have in here today in terms of people who advise public sector institution, but to the extent you do that, 2885 uh, may have more valence for you. And I think with that, we can move on. Okay, so this is the first of three. I guess the third one is not criminal in nature, but they're related to the same overarching concept, which is sexually explicit uh, digitally altered or artificial intelligence generated content. The definitions vary a little bit across the three bills, but they're all driving kind of at the same thing. Um, this one is the most perhaps interesting, but perhaps most problematic. Although again, it's not a criminal error. I'm not going to be the one to tell you. Um, this one changes existing child pornography prohibitions under law, which carry some pretty stiff penalties to also criminalize the distribution or um, possession of what looks like child pornography, but isn't because it was created through artificial intelligence. Um, so if it appears to be a person under the age of 18, it shall be. Um, I, I don't really have a whole lot else to say about that just because I'm not an expert in this area. And I think that it probably faces some constitutional hurdles uh, of a different nature than the list that Beverly was talking about with respect to speech, which I'm more familiar with. But I would imagine that this is really in the eye of the beholder, although I'm sure there will be some very bright line instances of things that are, are quite terrible. And indeed, the legislative findings for this bill illustrate that very well. Uh, I think it remains to be seen how much this will actually change the scope of liability for uh, what is called typically CASM, child abuse sexual, child, yeah, child abuse sexual material. And I would guess that if it appears to be someone under the age of 18, it is going to appear to be someone under the age of 18 regardless. But nevertheless, um, we have now amended this law to encompass explicitly digitally altered or artificial intelligence generated depictions of underage people. Okay, let's move on to the next one. All right, so this is a slightly more interesting lower scope of liability here. It's just misdemeanor disorderly conduct. But again, we're talking about nudity or sexually explicit imagery and distribution of it, not limited to children. Um, that is essentially akin to a deep fake. Um, someone who appears to be in a state of undress revealing um, intimate areas of their body or engaged in sex and if a reasonable person would believe that it is an authentic image of the person in question, then it is treated in the same way that a, I think the statute actually mentions the word people, um, sort of cameras that were furtively hidden in bathrooms kind of in yesteryear, maybe that still happens, uh, but that kind of uh, videotaping or sort of looking into someone's space uh, where they're privately doing something that is sexual in nature. Uh, you know, it's going to be treated the same way if it if the material that is being captured is, you know, seems to be an authentic image of a person. Um, the statute basically built in this definition doesn't require that the person actually have engaged in viewing, but the recording activity is basically going to be analogous to the creation of that content. Um, now, whether anyone would know about it was presumably a question about distribution, uh, but we, I think we can all imagine some scenarios when this would come into play. Um, again, it's a misdemeanor and it goes into effect on January 1 of next year. And then finally, an interesting one about social networks. So we can move on to the next slide. 
I'm just powering through these. Um, so the same sort of rubric that we just talked about with respect to non-child images, uh, where it's an intimate body part or the engaged or a person engaging in sex, or what appears to be that person engaging in sex or in, in the nude, um, is going to be applied against social media platforms of a certain, the same threshold that applies, you know, throughout this, this bill, uh, or sorry, throughout the statute in the business and professions code that says what a social media platform is and, and, and the thresholds that, re that are required. Um, it, this would make them responsible for removing those types of images or content to the extent a user, which does not have to be the person who is depicted, uh, complains. And uh, during the pendency of an investigation of such a complaint, the content must be restricted from access. Um, the statute does not get into any sort of detail about what happens if the content, uh, if the uh, platform concludes that the complained about content is not subject to this, the definitions in SB 981. Uh, but if it is, they are to issue, they are, I guess, in any, in either scenario to issue a statement uh, to the complainant within 30 days, uh, extendable to 60 if they need extra time. Um, and I think it's important to remember that for the most part, the social media platforms that we all use have content moderation policies that already prohibit anything of this nature to be in with. Um, it pretty closely adheres to, if anyone's familiar with, for example, Instagram's uh, guidelines where, you know, a female nipple is not allowed, male nipple is, uh, the statute tracks that pretty, pretty, pretty tightly. Um, so this is probably aligns pretty well with large social media platforms practices around content moderation already. And thus the the penalties and the scope of its application in practice may be somewhat limited just because there are so many uh, social media platforms that already do this. It will be interesting to see whether uh, the definition of a social media platform could be extended to uh, what I'll just call pornography services or websites, um, because to some extent, they some of them uh, involve features that might subject them to the definition of social media platform. I think that remains to be seen. Um, and it certainly doesn't, it's certainly not an intent of the bill to target that. I think it's more intended to be true social media platforms. It's just the, the definitional slippage is possible. And of course, pornography sites may change and evolve over time to have more social features. Uh, many of them already do have to some extent, some of the things that would bring you into scope, which is connecting users to communicate and have profiles um, on the service. For the most part, that's a general idea of what it says. Um, I think with that, we just have one left, which kind of is a nice bow tie on a lot of the threads that we've talked about um, overall today. It's a vetoed bill, Senate Bill 1047. Um, I don't know if Doug or Beverly, you want to sort of introduce this. Um, I think it's it's got a little bit for everyone because it covers a lot of the sort of issues that we've been discussing earlier. Well, just, you know, from a a 40,000 foot level, what it sought to do was to require safety testing of AI systems or models before they were released to the public. It would have given the uh, state attorney general the right to sue companies over serious harms uh, caused by those technologies, uh, including death or property damage. Uh, it also mandated a kill switch uh, to turn off AI systems in case of potential biowarfare or mass casualties uh, right. or property damage. Um, and uh, Newsom, Governor Newsom vetoed the bill um, for reasons that um, are, are interesting. Uh, he yeah. said it was flawed because it focused too much uh, on regulating the biggest AI systems, uh, those are known as frontier models, without considering potential risks and harms from the technology. And uh, uh, what's also interesting is that support for the legislation uh, was uh, uh, brought together a couple of strange bedfellows. Uh, Elon Musk, of all people, uh, supported it, 
uh, as did uh, a group of uh, entertainers, including Jane Fonda, Mark Ruffalo, uh, Shonda Rhimes, Joseph Gordon-Levitt, uh, all of whom urged uh, Governor Newsom to sign the bill, but uh, he elected not to uh, and uh, really said- Yeah, you know, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. I, I mean, I think that there is a lot of, I, I can understand why there was a lot of support for this in theory. I think that in practice, it kind of broke down. Newsom's message is a little bit of, is a very polite way of saying this doesn't seem to work the way that you think it does. Um, for one thing, it, it's uh, the definitional sort of crux of this bill is the idea of a covered model. Um, and just to be a little bit technological for a moment, a model is a file of math. I mean, really, if you if you wanted to ask someone in the space what what you're actually talking about, you could go on huggingspace.co and you can see tons of them. It's a very large file that contains math equations. Um, so we'll get to why that's problematic for implementing a kill switch um, because it's not a system. Um, but the first problem is that just before development, you have to decide whether you're going to reach certain thresholds at which you have to make certain other discretionary sort of non-discretionary decisions about the way that you'll operationalize this later uh, that can't really be undone um so i think that's been part of the pushback from the technology space just that these uh don't necessarily change over time although there was a mechanism by which a new regulatory body could update these thresholds um but it's not going to be entirely clear to people at the beginning of embarking on the creation of something, whether it's going to, you know, be under or above these particular thresholds. Um, and I think it's also important to remember that it wouldn't, it was not just about the largest frontier models. It's also any fine tuning or uh, sort of augmentation of something that already exists. For example, like an open source model of stable diffusion, if you will, for generating images. Um, which a lot of businesses, because it's open source, use to build upon uh, and customize and make a little bit better for their particular you know, technology that they're using to deploy it. They're also going to be subject to this rule, even though they had nothing to do with the original training and may not know that much about it, um, because they may be fine tuning to a degree that exceeds those thresholds. So I think that's part of the problem that that people encountered and then also the definitional craziness of whether something is reasonably capable of creating uh you know a, a chemical weapon or <laughs> causing mass casualties I, I think it's entirely dependent on use so it's a little bit hard for anyone to know how to implement those things and then finally there's the problem of a covered model not being subject to i mean how a model would implement a kill switch when it's something that's designed to be compatible with any number of systems it's kind of hard to imagine how that would be technologically feasible under the way that anyone would interpret the actual term. Uh, we just talked a lot. So Doug, do you want to go back to the veto message? I mean, I think the veto message was, this is probably overkill. Uh, and we may see, yeah. a, we, we may see a, a version of 1047 surface, you know, here or at the federal level. Uh, or in another state that is a little bit more, I think, thoughtful in its scope and application. But the idea of regulating something based on what it could possibly be used to do by someone else is kind of an inherent impossibility when we're talking about uh, a model that's designed to produce output that's tailored to human input or the input that it receives, I guess as the OECD definition would have it. Yeah, if you can put up the uh, final uh, uh, substantive slide that has the uh, veto message on it, uh, you know, you'll see that um, uh, Governor Newsom, you know, suggested that he's got things. So uh, I've got one more slide after that. There we yeah. go. Um, you'll see that, you know, he's, he's sympathetic to the aims of the bill uh, but, you know, has said that it needs more work and, um, you know, this really would have put California in the forefront of, um, of this issue. And I think he wanted to be, uh, or at least he says he wanted to be, uh, a little more careful about this and a little more uh, comprehensive uh, and, you know, not uh, essentially uh, impose obligations that weren't 
uh, uh, to be imposed uh, across the board to all who might, uh, for whom this technology might be relevant. So, you know, whether we, whether that's to be believed or not, that's, that is kind of what he said. And, uh, and we'll see, I think, uh, whether in the next session, uh, this, uh, all of this gets revisited. Uh, one of the things that the author complained about, uh, Scott Weiner from San Francisco, was that uh, the governor's office didn't intervene early on to right. indicate, uh, you know, what its concerns were. Uh, and so the veto came kind of uh, kind of out of the blue, uh, so he says. So uh, so we will see. Uh, but yeah, we may well, see something more akin to the European Union's AI Act, which is a little bit I mean, a little bit. It's a sweeping broad, but on the important issues of when certain things are going to be high risk, as it's termed there, it's a little bit easier to understand how something could lead to those particular effects because it's not focused on the nature of the output, but intended use cases and where deployments occur. Um, so I definitely think that that's worth paying attention to should this be reintroduced. Uh, we've seen California adopt European style regulations in the past. CCPA is effectively a, a clone with some important modifications of the general data protection or regulation. Um, and of course, past four years after that went into effect, the EU AI Act is in effect to some extent, to a limited extent right now, and will go further into effect over the coming years. So we may see something more akin to that in the future. It's getting at the same problem. So uh, with that, I think we're uh, we're open for questions. Uh, if uh, Randy, do you want to uh, be our gatekeeper? Sure. Yeah. Thank you very much. That was so informative and a lot to take in. So thank you for walking us through that. Um, I guess because there's a lot of us who are entertainment lawyers, as you know, on this um, meeting. Um, one question touched upon, uh, since we represent a number of celebrities, um, maybe you could tell us, are there any uh, specific rules attached to a celebrity endorsement of a particular political candidate? Maybe that's something for Beverly to address. Sure. Um, and there are not unless the celebrity is paid to appear in a campaign communication. So um, celebrities are, you know, like any people have the right to to make an endorsement. And if a celebrity is paid to appear in an ad, um, then that is something that must be put on the disclaimer and use a report that is filed that says, you know, so-and-so was paid and here's how much they were paid. But strict, strictly for endorsements, I mean, also I'm not aware personally of any celebrity like pay, being paid by a candidate for an endorsement that um, is not something that I actually have knowledge of happening. I may, but um, I don't, I, the premise that a celebrity is paid to endorse is um, not necessarily one that I'm, saying it's, it's taking place. I guess along the similar vein, if there's a particular, let's say television show that is um, in effect talking about a particular candidate, is there specific disclosures for the that television series or something of that nature? Are we talking about perhaps a satirical uh, or a parody type show then? No, I mean, and, and these laws that we were discussing here are all ones that wouldn't really apply to like a, a show where there's somebody you know, who's obviously fictitiously portraying a candidate. It would only apply to something where you, know, you can't really detect. It would appear to a reasonable person that it is likely to be an authentic image. And so it doesn't apply to Alec Baldwin impersonating Donald Trump. Like who we all know, he does a great impersonation, but we know it's not Donald Trump. This is what the things we're talking about in these bills are are much more um, uh, nuanced and like harder to detect uh, impersonation. So, and and there are also I should have mentioned this: there are exemptions for broadcast stations from these bills for covering these kind of communications, or they can also put a disclaimer saying that things don't actually act accurately represent any actual event. But I don't think there's any danger that like a parody show would have to include a disclaimer saying like that this is not an actual event because it's obvious to the viewer that it is not an actual event. And are there rules with respect to equal time for the various candidates? Um, 
and distinction between a news show or a parody show? Is that something that you handle or? or uh, well, I, uh, there are equal time rules for advertising for federal candidates, but that doesn't apply to parody type shows. I mean, I don't, I don't advise on this issue, but it, it is, um, there's nothing regulating um, how much time you have to give to a candidate on, on a parody show. That's kind of up to the, um, that's like their first amendment right to artistic and free speech. And maybe Doug has more. Oh, well, too. although we know that uh, in this last cycle, um, the appearance by Kamala Harris on SNL was met with a, an equal time uh, complaint by the Trump campaign. And uh, in fact, NBC gave Trump uh, twice as much time as uh, Kamala Harris had uh, on air uh, by way of commercial time following um, uh, sporting events. I'm not sure I, I recall exactly which. Uh, it may have been an NFL game or it may have been uh, uh, something along those lines. Uh, and so, you know, that's, uh, and, and that decision that was made to do that uh, was somewhat controversial and, uh, uh, and you know, I don't know whether, in fact, the equal time rules uh, would have mandated that. But uh, out of an abundance of caution, I think NBC decided let's let's give them the time. Yeah, and I think there's a difference between also like featuring the candidate versus like a act of parodying the candidate too is like somewhat those would be handled differently. But yeah, that's a good point. That um, and I hadn't I had not been aware of the NBC decision to do that. So interesting concerns. Uh, does California have a deep fake law for living personalities like the Elvis Act? So um, uh, the uh, Elvis Act is an interesting uh, piece of legislation that was recently enacted in Tennessee. Um, and uh, it is intended to effectively uh, uh, augment uh, what had not been a particularly robust right of publicity statute in that state. Um, Elvis, by the way, stands for ensuring likeness, voice, and right. image security. So uh, in addition to it being protective of you-know-who, uh, that's, uh, that's what the acronym stands for. Um, but to answer the question more specifically, um, California is interesting in that uh, the statute governing the right of publicity for living individuals, which is Civil Code 3344, uh, as opposed to 3344.1, which is the one that governs uh, deceased personalities. 3344 doesn't contain the same expressive works exemption. And so a lot of the cases that have been decided under it, starting with uh, Comedy 3, the case involving the Three Stooges, uh, is a case where, uh, you know, the courts have essentially applied the law outside of the commercial context, outside of goods and services, and, uh, and applied it in that case to lithographs, uh, which are sort of an expressive medium. Uh, and subsequently, video game cases involving uh, NCAA football players and professional football players uh, have likewise taken advantage of the statute. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the way California law has developed, uh, there is also another line of authority involving the common law right of publicity. And that's what's been invoked in other lookalike and soundalike cases. So cases involving, for example, uh, a robotic Vanna White, cases involving a unique pitching stance by a former Dodger non Don Newcomb, uh, sound alike voices of Bette Midler uh, have all been actionable under California's common law right of publicity. And that common law right of publicity uh, will, in my view, uh, likely be applicable to uh, to digital replica. Uh, Doug, is there, does that one, there, I think there's case law to support the idea that that has to be a commercial use. Is that right? No. There's not. No, not really. I mean, you know, the the comedy three case establishes that that's uh, that that's not the case. And uh, whether you want to view, uh, I don't know how you want to view video games, but they are, uh, you know, at least according to the Supreme Court, uh, they are expressive works too. Uh, 
that are equally protected. So right. it doesn't apply to necessarily just goods or services. Okay, well, um, I think it's about time we wrap up. Um, I know that we could continue talking about all of this forever, and uh, we definitely look forward to um, reaching back out to you all as uh, we know that the legislation will continue to evolve as um, AI does. Um, and so thank you very much, and um, ha ha have a great rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. You may be eligible for CLE credit in your state. Visit bhba.org slash podcasts for more information. Mm -hmm.